Thank you, Kimberly, You're and welcome. thank you to, to our artists this morning. That was so beautiful. It was such a wonderful way to start the morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I, I'm delighted to, to join you on the second day of the Creating Healthy Communities convening. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Jill Sonke, uh, Ali Lakuta, and the rest of the Center for Arts and Medicine for inviting me to share some thoughts with you today. And Kimberly, thank you for, for getting us going this morning as well. Um, to all of you in attendance, um, thank you for what you do from your different perches. I believe that the work at the intersection of arts and creating healthy communities is one of the most generative and important as we work towards fulfilling our, our full potential as individuals and, and as a nation. Uh, I'm honored to have been appointed to serve as chair of the NEA by President Biden. I've been in my position for a little over eight months now, and it's really an interesting time to work from this perch. Um, the last two and a half years have been challenging, to say the least. A pandemic, heightened racial reckoning, and a season of related proclamations to do better. Social and political polarization, global instability, environmental challenges. And the arts as a whole and segments within the sector have been especially hard hit. The health field has been challenged and stretched. And it has been, and I think continues to be, an extraordinary time. It's full of trials. But there's also evidence of strength, resilience, flexibility, and possibility. And in so many ways, I think in our personal and professional lives, we've been challenged to question what we have held as orthodoxy, um, what we may have thought of as not negotiable. At our best, our creativity, imagination, generosity, and nimbleness have allowed us to respond, to adapt, to step up. And hopefully, in the process, we've also honed our ability to discern to see more clearly what is essential and what is not. And I think that at this time, when so many of us have the opportunity or the obligation to reset, we have to be intentional about not just snapping back to romanticized notions of what was pre-pandemic. And sometimes that's hard. Um, but as we guide investments, as we make policies, design programs, I think it's imperative to take stock and figure out what we've learned, what we've known and has been affirmed, and what has been challenged or even debunked. And while I'm in an ongoing process of taking stock, I'm happy to share with you some things that I feel pretty certain about and these are things that are guiding my work from this particular perch. So first, I think the ability for all people to make sense of the world and be creatively expressive on their own terms is a key element of justice, equity, and a healthy existence. Second, our concept of art and cultural engagement has to be expansive and we, it can't be limited only to professional production for consumption. Third, art process can be as important as, and in some cases even more important than art product. And sometimes that's hard to, to wrangle with. Um, fourth, artists, culture bearers, designers, they have many different kinds of really important relationships with publics and by extension, many possible ways of asserting in their careers beyond the too few and narrow paths that have been paved. And last, the arts are intrinsically valuable, period, full stop. I think at the same time, 
There are also critical elements of other community dynamics, needs, aspirations, including those deeply connected to creating healthy communities. So while I've been working in the arts for more than 25 years, I come at this from a base in urban planning and comprehensive community development, focused on justice and equity, and especially for historically marginalized communities. And what I know for sure is that none of the things that we have said we aspire to as a nation of opportunity, none of those are possible or durable without understanding the role of the arts and related work. So the arts help us make sense of the world, offer us different ways of thinking, feeling, being. They're a source of inspiration and innovation. They're critically important to our resilience and help us protect and advance our humanity. A framework I've used for a few years now as I tried to boil down the myriad ways that the arts intersect with a number of different fields, including health, is that the arts are crucial to helping us reframe, that is, see things differently and become available for paradigm shift, right? So the arts help us engage head, heart, hand, what it takes to be available, to have a shift in how we think, a real shift. So reframing is important. They help us retool or expand or change the ways in which we've gone about addressing challenges, how we do our work. And actually, they help us do the work of repair, the work of mending, of healing, and of growing anew. I believe that the arts are often preconditions for things we say we want to achieve, and they're essential to getting us unstuck. For the last several years, I've watched with great hope and anticipation as the health field deepens its interest in social and environmental determinants of health and strengthens its connection to community development and the arts, strengthening, I think, our approaches to creating healthy communities where all people can thrive. In 2019, as Kimberly mentioned, I was part of a collaboration between the Center for Arts and Medicine at the University of Florida and Art Place America, a 10-year initiative to advance creative placemaking, so the integration of arts and culture into community development and planning with a focus on addressing inequities and community empowerment. And this resulted in the creation of a cross-disciplinary network of people in health, community development, and the arts. Uh, that experience, the resulting manuscript, and other work that I've been involved in over the years of, uh, as part of uh, the California Endowments Building Healthy Communities Initiative, plus awareness of longstanding work at the intersection of arts and health at the NEA, all of that has been really impactful in shaping my ideas about what is possible at this time while I'm at the helm of the Arts Endowment. And as I've traveled in the last few months, both nationally and, and abroad, and I've been talking about some concepts, right? I've been talking about some co concepts that undergird my work in Washington. One of those concepts is artful lives, the importance of living lives that are full of art. It's an inclusive concept that contains everything from the quotidian, sometimes non-professional, but deeply meaningful practices and expressions inherent in our everyday lived experiences and opportunities for learning, to the making, presentation, and dissemination of professional art forms from our all disciplines and traditions, work that can be sublime and transcendent. Another idea that I've been talking about and building out is this notion of arts in all or arts at the intersections and the nomenclature isn't quite there yet, but I'll share the idea. And it's, you know, it has to do with what it takes to unleash the full power of art. And I think it requires not existing only in isolation or in a bubble. It requires animating work at the intersection of arts, education, community development, climate, and more, including, very importantly, work at the intersection of health and well-being. And delivering the full power of the arts requires building what 
I call an arts-infused civic infrastructure. So art defined expansively, woven into the relationships and mechanisms that we rely on to care for each other. So these ideas are impacting how the NEA is and will be showing up. Of course, we'll continue to be a funder and a grant maker, which is how we're primarily known, but we, I think we'll also start to assert as a national resource for creating and bolstering healthy arts ecosystems that contribute to creating healthy communities where all people can thrive, where people can lead artful lives, and where the important work happening at the intersection of arts and other fields of policy and practice is advanced. So what does this mean specifically? As a national resource, the NEA will access all of the assets available uh, to it to marshal uh, towards our mission. And this includes grant money and financial resources for special initiatives, but it also will leverage relationships with other federal agencies. The pulpit, the bullhorn of the executive branch, the imprimatur of the federal government, the infrastructure of state arts organizations, regional arts organizations, and local arts agencies, as well as other networks, will leverage the view and analysis that we can render from a national perch, our ability to con conduct and commission research about the roles of the arts in our society, including focusing on health and well being our ability to connect and convene communities of learning and practice, our ability to catalyze and amplify. As part of a suite of actions to help the arts endowment participate as a national resource, there are some changes that uh, lead, I think, to more effective grant making and bundled investments in the work that we want to advance. I think it's important to note that we're not starting from scratch. There are examples of precedents to build from, including the work of the arts education team with its fo focus on collective impacts, the work of the Our Town program through its field building efforts in collaboration with philanthropy and other organizations, the NEA Interagency Task Force on Arts and Human Development, and several other initiatives at the intersection of arts and health, um, among others. And recently, there have been some developments that I think bode really well for this orientation and our particular focus on arts, health, and well-being. Earlier this year, after a thorough assessment of NEA work and a robust process for capturing feedback on priorities internally and externally, the Arts Endowment adopted a new strategic plan. And the plan specifically calls out our commitment to continue and to expand our focus on the intersection of the arts with our nation's health and well-being. With many years of related work to harvest from and make better known, under the leadership of Sunil Iyengar, who I know you've heard from yesterday and will hear more from today, a cherished colleague, um, with Sunil and the support of other colleagues, we're reframing our many arts-related initiatives and investments into a cogent body of work that more readily helps people understand the breadth and depth of what's happened to date. So this will also potentially enable us to see patterns and connections among discrete pieces of work that we may not have seen before. We were recently involved, and I'll share a few of the things that, that are coming together in this more cogent body of work. And one is a partnership that we were recently involved in with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the CDC Foundation. And this was to launch an initiative that engages artists and arts organizations to promote, to promote COVID vaccine readiness in their communities. This will also potentially, um, oh, as a result from this particular initiative, uh, funding from the CDC and CDC Foundation awarded grants to 30 organizations nationwide to support these efforts. And I think this will result in being able to repeat that kind of activity um, in other instances. It's a, it's a good precedent. Through our research grants and NEA research labs, we're exploring the art's ability to treat chronic pain, improve longitudinal health outcomes in the general population, 
help delay cognitive decline among older adults, and foster social and emotional development in early childhood. One of the NEA research labs is led by Jill Sonke uh, and is a partnership between the University of Florida for Arts and Medicine, Pro Arts and Medicine program and a collaboration with Daisy Fancourt and her team from University College London. And this entity is called the Epi Arts Lab. Um, as an initial step, by analyzing longitudinal databases, the lab is exploring the impacts of arts and cultural engagement on population health outcomes in the US. It's also looking at how all that works. Another significant and longstanding area of work involves our collaboration with the US Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs on an initiative called Creative Forces. So focused on military and veteran populations exposed to trauma, as well as their families and caregivers, this initiative places creative arts therapies at the core of patient-centered care at clinical sites throughout the country, including telehealth services and increase, increasing access to community arts activities to promote health, wellness, and quality of life. And I've had a long interest in what are the implications for this kind of work beyond a clinical setting, beyond military populations. So there's big, big um, interest in that realm. Starting at the onset of the pandemic and through this past July, the intersection of art and health was demonstrated through another effort, Operation OASIS, a resilience program of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, and this was in response to COVID-19. And as part of the program, Creative Forces Creative Art Therapists provided weekly virtual art-based wellness workshops for healthcare workers across the Defense Health Agency. So again, an expansion of uh, previous work and um, evidence of flexibility as a result of needing to shift. At the federal level, our partnerships are extremely important for us in integrating the arts and health and healing efforts nationwide. And it's why we formed an interagency task force on the arts and human development. So this convenes once a quarter to catalyze research opportunities and information sharing with our peer agencies. Um, consulting the task force, we issued a 2019 report about how the arts can be used to help combat the opioid crisis in America. One of the federal opportunities that has borne fruit in recent years is our collaboration with the National Institutes of Health to support research on music, health, and wellness. And this has led to the establishment of the NEA Sound Health Network, a partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, and in collaboration with uh, the John F. Kennedy Center and uh, its artistic advisor, Renee Fleming. And the Sound Health Network connects neuroscientists and health practitioners with musicians and music therapists. Its, its mission is to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and wellness. And there's evidence of relevant work in other facets at the Arts Endowment. For example, work through our Our Town program, which is our portfolio most connected to community development, often um, includes projects at the local level focused on health and wellness related opportunities and outcomes, including better nutrition, access to spaces for more active living, and programs that are relevant to mental health indirectly and directly. In addition to the programs I just described, I want to share a couple of other developments with you in the federal realm that are worth, worth lifting up because I think that they directly or indirectly affect our work at the intersection of arts and health. So as many of you know, one of President Biden's first actions was to issue an all-government executive order on racial equity and support for underserved communities. And this has required all federal agencies, including the NEA, to bolster efforts to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion and report on progress on a regular basis. Because our work in underserved communities includes populations that are often at greater health risks, the likelihood that we can bridge arts offerings and health interventions is significant and now has the backing to become, to become even more robust, potentially. 
Over the summer, the Biden administration stood up a new initiative called United We Stand, taking action to prevent and address hate-motivated violence and, fi and foster unity. So this is an, not an executive order, but it's an all-government initiative involving tending to the aftermath of horrific events, but also focusing on their prevention. The NEA and NEH were invited to participate in this initiative alongside Departments of Justice, Education, Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, Treasury, AmeriCorps, IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences, um, and others. And this effort creates a call for work that NEH Chair Shelley Lowe and I were already discussing, focused on the role of arts and humanities in creating more kind, just, and humane communities work at the local level and national levels that I think can bridge easily to interests in bolstering our focus on mental health at individual and community levels. Most recently, the president issued another all of government executive order, uh, recognizing that contributions of arts and humanities or our cultural vitality, not only in economic terms, but more broadly on a focus on health and well-being of the nation and the future of democracy itself is what the executive order includes. And it also provides for advancing arts, humanities, museums, and libraries as strategic elements in a wide range of federal aims. And it directs other federal agencies to enter into partnerships with NEA, NEH, and IMLS. So the executive order resurrects the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, and I'm hopeful that this order also will bolster the work at the intersection of arts and health in ways that are both known and hopefully surprising. So there's more. There's uh, the Mayor's Institute on City Design, which we're ex expanding, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, which are support mechanisms for elected officials and others to deal with wicked problems. There's an opportunity to expand these and also to focus on health and, relate, and related issues as part of that context. And there's more, but I'll stop there and um, to talk a little bit about um, how we work together. I think at, at our best, we, all of us, um, understand the advantages and limitations of the respective purchase that we occupy, and we have to think strategically of what, what we can do from where we sit. Um, I believe that we're in a fertile environment to advance important work. At our best, we're clear about what we can and need to make durable, what we seed and hopefully see grow, perhaps beyond our control, and what we know is for a season. I believe that the NEA can't do its best work without open channels of communication with you and the benefit of your experience, your perspectives, and your reach. Our ability to learn together, to share insights, adjust, coordinate, all of that is essential, and I believe that to my core. I'm so grateful to be able to share this direction in some of these areas of work with you. I'm excited about what we might do together um, I'm excited about seizing the opportunities that are available to us, even in complicated times. And with that, I'll stop, and thank you for listening. Testing, are we on? Oh, great, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sunil Iyengar, um, director of the Office of Research and Analysis. Meet my boss. <laughs> really wonderful to, to, to have her, you here, uh, Dr. Jackson. Um, I'd like to submit, yesterday was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, I had a panel. Um, but one thing I missed, and maybe we can compensate for this now, is I'd like to hear from more of you. Um, so I'd encourage you to get, get up and move, make your way to one of the mics, and we can get some questions out here, if you'd like. Um, as you make your way up, great, got that. Handing out mics for anyone who wants them. 
Um, as, you, as we're waiting, uh, Dr. Jackson, um, could you, you know, one of the things you mentioned, which, you know, you said it in a phrase, and I, I've heard us talk about this before, is sort of this, this idea, that, you know, the NEA is not only a grant maker, but, um, you know, this idea of potentially bundled services, you know, can you speak a little bit to what that means, bundled services? I know we're kind of still evolving in how we think about that as an agency, but you lifted up some good examples of how that works, just so people understand that. Yeah, so, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, I think that we've been thought of as a grant maker, you know, where you go to submit a proposal to get money for projects, primarily, that, that has been the interpretation. We actually do a lot more, and Sunil is one of those people who does uh, other things beyond the grant making, which is critically important to, to be sure. The grant making is absolutely important. I think that as a federal agency, we have other assets to draw from beyond grant money. And um, being intentional about how to bundle uh, a financial investment with a learning community, uh, with access to other networks, uh, connecting those entities to other uh, players or relevant activity. Yeah. This is all something that we have the capacity to do, even looking to the executive office as a place to lift ideas, no. to give them visibility. Uh, we're, we have the capacity to, we're building the capacity and have access to these resources. So that's what I mean by a more, more bundled approach. Yeah. And in fact, as you pointed out, the Our Town program has this terrific technical assistance program, which is another shining example which we can lift up. And you mentioned collective impact in arts education. Um, so uh, is that, were you, oh, I was looking to see if you have a question. Oh, great, perfect, go ahead. Uh, good morning, I'm Josh Miller uh, with Ideas X Lab and Dr. Jackson, I really appreciated your comments and what you shared this morning. Uh, one of the things I was wondering about as we think about coming out of COVID, the racial reckoning, all of the work that you talked about, especially over the past few years, um, how the NEA is thinking about rest equity, um, and I, I would lift this up to the other funders and also people working in the field, um, for the artists, for the creative leaders, the organizations who are helping to bring and lead us through and organize around this work, what is, how do we prioritize and fund rest for the people who are really being impacted while helping to create and kind of convene us around this work. So I'd love to just hear how you all may be thinking about or approaching that. I'm sorry, Josh, was the word rest? Rest, yes. Okay, could you elaborate on that a little bit for those of us who don't know much about it? Yeah, so I'm just thinking about, um, you know, all of the different components of the stressors of, as we're leading this work, whether it was being the arts organization that brought community together during the pandemic, the artists on the front lines protesting, like for Breonna Taylor or for racial justice, um, how can funders and organizers and project planners build in rest as part of the plan, as part of the budget? How do we refuel and re-energize people who are doing this work? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question, and I hadn't heard heard the term rest equity before, so thank you for introducing that to me anyway. Um, you know, I think you're making me think of, of what something I said earlier, which is about resisting doing what we've always done and questioning orthodoxies around what work needs to look like um, and what it takes to accomplish the goals that, that we've set forward. I think there, there is an opportunity, not just uh, with grant makers, but more generally, to think about what work requires and what it means to be human and do work. Um, it would be really interesting to figure out how how would that become a criteria? And I'm not saying, you know, there's things you can do in government and there are things you can't do in government. Um, but I, I'm curious, what would grant guidelines look like that um, had provisions for that orientation? Could I, could I yeah, pull the please. curtain back a little bit to please. something that you're doing? So when, as soon as Dr. Jackson joined, she really set aside time for reflection and we as a staff, you know, actually reflected and had sessions where we'd reflect, but also 
we were given the time and the kind of the grace to think about how we would like to move forward in our workflow and, and as an agency. And so we have this so-called uh, culture of work committee that sounds really official, but it's actually, it's really, it, it's, it's really helping us track the workflow of the grant making process from soup to nuts and where can we embed opportunities for more greater reflection and action to improve uh, equity and in grant making among other things. And so those kinds of measures at least we're trying to, I think there's some modeling going on for us as staff and we're learning, but certainly we need to hear from you about those kinds of things, uh, uh, the stressors and how to be alleviate them in the work that gets done through the, the things we support. Oh, it's, it's a lot of hands are up. Thank you. Oh, there you go, go ahead, sorry. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm Rose Grace with Bethune Cookman University. I'm an educator and a performer, and also involved in arts and wellness. And I guess my question, I've been really thinking about it a lot, and I appreciate, Dr. Jackson, what you said about the process sometimes is more crucial than the product. And I guess, um, I think it relates to Josh's question too, especially for all the big grant funding organizations. How do we shift that paradigm model in existence of assessments that receive the grant awards. And while I am certainly not negating the importance of quantitative uh, assessments that are always, you know, that need to be reproduced uh, and make the projects reproducible, but I think often many of us in the community have projects that at least at the beginning stage, do not always fit that model of quantitative assessment, and yet the process and just the implementation of this work is just as crucial, if not more, and it doesn't always get, in fact, it often does not get funded because we don't fit into the current assessment model. How can we, at the NEA level and other organizations, change that paradigm shift? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I, you know, I've been a proponent of developing alternative frameworks for understanding how to value art, uh, and particularly the kinds of practices that don't lead to something that ends up on stage or um, ends up in an exhibition. So there, there's something about recognizing the different ways that both an arts career or um, an avocational practice or the commitments of institutions, uh, recognizing how those can be valued, um, using different kinds of, I, I wanna say metrics, but it doesn't always necessarily devolve to metrics. I mean, one of the things that was notable to me in the last executive order was that uh, there was mention of the economic impact of the arts, which is, is important. It wasn't the only thing that was listed as a way of valuing the arts. Its connection to health and well-being, its connection to our democracy, to me that bodes well for helping us create a larger aperture for understanding how to talk about the value. It doesn't answer your question in a tangible way, but I think that there are um, signs that there's an openness, maybe now, to, to alternative ways of understanding how to value something. Samuel, yeah, I was just gonna say, Dr. Jackson was a really strong proponent of that when we, when we were, you know, all the years we've known each other and our office has interacted with her from a research point of view, uh, really you know, pushing us to think beyond, like we, at one point we were pursuing indicator systems for arts and livability, dialing it back a bit and saying, what about indications versus indicators? You know, what about the physical, the manifestation of this through, that can be gleaned through stories, through case studies? And I think that is, is extremely important, that perspective, and I think you bring that to this, this certainly. Um, there were a couple, yes? Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for being here today and, and presenting. Um, I was wondering about the executive orders that you mentioned. Sorry, I'm just here in the middle. Oh, Hello. Yeah, uh, where are you? Where are um, you? you? You mentioned about uh, the, the executive orders from, from uh, President Biden, as well as this interinstitutional and inter in, intergovernmental work to kind of create more uh, collaborative efforts, I suppose. 
And if I feel like I'm speaking for many of us here in the sense that the arts are one of our greatest ways for collaboration and cohesion. So what efforts are occurring within government to employ more time, somewhat building upon Josh Miller's uh, comment around rest equity, to create opportunities for governmental employees to connect with one another through the arts at work? It seems like something that we should do. I think it's something we should do too. I agree. <laughs> um, we're, you know, we're we're trying. The NEA is really in a really interesting position right now. We're trying to learn the lessons from the last couple of years. We've embraced hybrid as a way of trying to be. Um, I'm certainly committed to recognizing that creative practice among staff is part of our work. Um, figuring out how to do that within a government structure and uh, push up against compliance requirements and similar, it, it's, it's part, of, it's part yeah. of the work. You know, yeah. it's, it's uh, not impossible, I think, but it requires intention and attention and paradigm shift. Um, so, you know, I, I share your sensibility. Um, figuring out how to do that is part of what we're up to. It requires uh, agility and entrepreneurship in the government, right? Which you've really spurred for us. Um, I, I, you know, I'd been wanting, I'd, I'd actually said uh, to um, Dr. Jackson, I want to introduce you to uh, Christopher Bailey, who's the arts and health lead, but I didn't think it would be on stage on the camera. This is historic. <laughs> Uh, the World Health Le uh, Organization Lee, who's, who's been quoted from his, um, his opening remarks from yesterday. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Jackson. Uh, my, the first part of my comment is to compliment you on your excellent staff. Um, uh, I think Sunil has been incredibly I catalytic uh, <laughs> and has done wonderful work. Uh, did you get my bank account number? <laughs> uh, no, I... Um, uh, the, the WHO tends to work in underserved communities. We don't do a lot of work uh, in the U.S. per se. Even PAHO focuses mostly on Latin America. Um, but, but I think um, particularly when some of the key health indicators are actually going in the wrong direction, uh, it's, it's drawing our attention. And in particular, I'm thinking in terms of maternal uh, health and mortality statistics, uh, and with uh, recent judicial decisions, how that uh, direction looks like it's going to be increasingly negative uh, here. Um, uh, I, I would like to invite you on behalf of WHO to join a growing conversation with ministers of culture that I'm engaged with uh, to talk about how to think about this as a human family and not as a national family. And uh, I think the arts are uniquely suited. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure you'd agree. I don't, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but we live in a time where we identify ourselves by denigrating others. And the, the arts, I think, are uniquely situated to bring together people into a common conversation and find common goals. Uh, and uh, I, I would love it if, uh, if you were interested in joining that conversation, and I invite you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you on stage, <laughs> and, and uh, thank you for that invitation. I will happily accept it. I think we're on the same page. As, you know, one of the things I said in my remarks is that the arts uniquely, I think, um, allow us to engage head, heart, and hand, intellectually, uh, emotionally, physically, and it's only then that we're open to paradigmatic shift. So I, I agree fully. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Uh, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Saxon as part of a panel, I believe, soon. So thank you very much. Thank you.